just the idea. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for bearing with us. Uh, welcome, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Just a few house rules to uh, get things going with. Just to say, uh, if you've got a mobile phone, please, for our panelists' sake, can you have it turned off? Uh, just to say, this is also being live uh, streamed on the internet, and it'll also be broadcast a week on Friday, 6 o'clock, on uh, Bloomberg Television, Hong Kong, and Singapore time. My name's Rashad Salamat. I'm the host of a program called uh, On The Move, which uh, goes out at 9 a.m. <laughs> on Bloomberg each and every morning. And uh, we will be ending with a Q&A session, and it'd be just uh, good if you could n mention your name and the organization that you uh, come from as well. Thank you very much indeed. We should start off any second. Well, we're here this morning to discuss the challenges facing the ASEAN nations and how we can move away from growth models that are, well, fairly dependent on the export side of things. How can we actually have a deal of a uh, greater degree of integration to move away from that and have intra-ASEAN uh, trade here as well? And uh, for that, of course, greater integration, and that brings us on to the subject of we're looking at ASEAN's networked future. And I'd like to introduce our guests. Uh, we have here Cesar Corisima, who is the Secretary of Finance for the Philippines. We have Hirohiko Kojima from Mitsubishi Corporation, also a co-chair of uh, the uh, World Economic Forum in East Asia as well. Harish Manwani is Global Chief Operating Officer for Unilever. And of course, we have over there Kitarat Narono. He is uh, the Finance Minister for Thailand. And last but certainly not least, Tarek Sultan Al Issa, who is the Managing Director of Agility Group as well. Now I'm going to start off with uh, asking each uh, of our participants about how they frame the debate, what they think the priorities are, and I'm going to start things off with Kitarat Ranong. Well, I uh, would like to be uh, most brief um, to say a few words about the relevance of this ทุกท่านเนี่ยจะนี่ก็ในเงี้ยเปียบๆตัวมาผิดบาเลยมันในเงี้ยมาจิมาเลยกว่าสิบาย a decade ago, the volume of trade within the region was lower than 20%, and as of now, it's already higher than 26%, and of course, 26% of the very high growth of trade. Um, Thailand, um, as sitting in the middle of the uh, mainland ASEAN member, and also we can... Uh, connect to our friends in the east, like the Philippines, Indonesia, and Brunei, and also down south, Malaysia, uh, Singapore. We believe that it's our responsibility to work the best with our uh, member friends in ASEAN to offer ourselves uh, to improve the uh, connectivity and transportation system uh, and the efficiency of the so-called logistic and transportation as being non-human resource costs would allow the so-called human resources to be more efficient and have the ability to earn more in order to uh, have higher possessing power uh, for their well-being, of course, and as being the uh, counter uh, trade partners with the other countries. That's what I believe. Kojima-san, you come, of course, from a Japanese perspective, but one which is, of course, with Mitsubishi, so ingrained in this part of the world. Please. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, it's the fact that the Asia has taken a greater in, uh, importance in recent years and as a key driver of global economic development and uh, likely continue to do so in the future, particularly under such circumstances. And now, and uh, Japan has a role, but uh, I'll speak uh, a little bit later. So what is the secret to Asia's sustained economic growth? I believe the reply is the region's economic diversity in terms of the different stage of development among nations. And uh, the fact that the Asian nations are in different stages of development allows companies to be uh, more selective in setting up uh, local production with labor costs rising in China. And the other potential production bases uh, like uh, Vietnam and Myanmar 
uh, ready to uh, catch up uh, the competitiveness. Investment in these nations and, uh, also serves to realize sustainable growth for the region as a whole and allows <coughs> more industrialized nations such as Japan, South Korea, and China to focus on more value-added business activities. This multi-level development framework gives Asia the flexibility of the regions. That is my point. Harish, I mean, I asked you whether you were global chief operating officer or Asian chief operating officer because you're based in Singapore, but it speaks volumes that you are based there, and it gives us an idea of the importance of this part of the world. <coughs> yeah, well, uh, uh, it's no surprise because 57% of Unilever's uh, global business Actually, it comes from developing uh, and emerging markets, and 90% of our growth comes from here. And if you just do a simple math, then 75% uh, of Unilever's business is going to be in the emerging markets with Asia as our biggest block, and ASEAN as a very significant block. If you look at ASEAN, for example, uh, we operate in every one of the 10 countries. So our presence, and we haven't, I mean, this is not new. We've been operating in some of these markets for 80 to 100 years. Um, from a business perspective, if I can just make a few comments on ASEAN, the first, of course, is that uh, we follow the people. There are 600 million people. Uh, this is one of the fastest growing parts of the world. And most importantly, it's been a, a beacon of stability in a context of a lot of economic turbulence that we've seen in the world. And that makes it very attractive. I think uh, the excitement and the challenges of ASEAN uh, are all related to how do we make this growth more inclusive, because that's really what will drive it, and how do we make it more consumption-led. Uh, so the first thing that I want to really put on the table is about how do we work together to create a consumption-led growth model. And this is, to my mind, one of the big challenges of, of ASEAN. Um, the second bit is around uh, building intellectual capital and talent. Uh, it's interesting that while ASEAN is a great story in terms of economic growth. If you just look at the number of patents, for example, or the number of PhDs, and I'm using this just as a surrogate, uh, the share of ASEAN is significantly lower than its economic share. And I think this is an area that, that needs to be worked at. The third, and to my mind, what we as Unilever feel very passionately about is this whole concept of sustainable growth. Because we live in a very resource-starved world, whether it's energy, water, and so on. And how do we work together between public, private uh, sectors to really create a growth model that will be, that will be not just uh, sort of uh, good economically, but good in terms of also being more sustainable? And lastly, if I can make one comment, which is something I often make, we often make within our company, what is the purpose of coming together as a block? And I think the purpose of coming together as a block has to be always to remember that you still have to be locally relevant. Uh, I think the point that was made about culturally, cultural diversity, national boundaries and sovereignty, locally relevant, regionally leveraged, and globally material. And I think to my mind, if you can hit these three, you hit the sweet spot. Cesar, as Ministry of uh, Finance, Secretary of Finance for the Philippines, presiding actually over one of the biggest stories right now in ASEAN. What's your view? Well, I believe the future of ASEAN is bright if we do things right. Imagine, uh, uh, as a single country, we'd be the third largest in population and seventh largest in GDP uh, right now. I believe we need to do things right in three main areas. In regulation, infrastructure, and people. In regulation, I think uh, we have to realize that there will be no room in an integrated ASEAN for regulatory nationalism. We all have to go for harmonization of our regulation in the areas of customs rules, in the areas of mutual recognition, in the areas of standard, uh, across the uh, board. Second, in infrastructure, I think what we need to attain is what I would refer to as complementary interconnectedness. I, you know, Companies like Unilever will have a main role in making this a reality by making sure that all 10 countries will be winners in integration. And they've started doing that by making countries specialize in certain products. At the global company level, I think that's good. What we need to do is work on regional companies and ultimately SMEs. The third area is people. 
Because after all, economies are about people. In ASEAN, we still have about 80 to 100 million people in poverty. And we need to make sure that we invest in them. And this is the, right at the heart of the agenda of President Aquino in the Philippines. We're investing in our people, our infrastructure, and we're opening up our country. And I think we're seeing the effects of that, that with better governance, we can unleash the potential of our country. Tarek, of course, logistics, the heart of your business, no doubt the heart of the priorities that you want to seek, and also, of course, these bottlenecks that do exist therein. Correct. Um, um, we tend to frame the, the opportunity as being one that's associated with the supply chain. Um, we all know that FDI is largely driven by how competitive uh, uh, the supply chain is, and the research shows that uh, up to 10% of growth uh, within uh, ASEAN is being uh, uh, literally robbed by uh, not addressing some of the supply chain barriers that, uh, that exist. So from a policy perspective, the low-hanging fruit um, um, is, is how do we uh, uh, address these, uh, the, these barriers? And I think you know, there's, there's two parts to them. There, there's the physical infrastructure barriers, and I think countries, by and large, are doing uh, quite a good job developing the physical infrastructure. There's some initiatives across um, um, that are being f uh, f uh, funded by the ADB through the, the East-West Corridor that are addressing um, the infrastructure from a, a, a regional perspective. I, I think countries can do more by filling in the gaps, working on selective basis on partnerships with uh, with private companies uh, to fill in the gaps that aren't being addressed by some of the larger plans. But by and large, I'm quite confident that from an infrastructure perspective, the governments uh, will, will get it right. Um, the main issue or the main concern is on the softer issues, the soft barriers. And, 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 and for me, there's three that I think are essential. The first is that when you look at the way um, countries uh, approach supply chain issues, um, these matters impacting the supply chain are dispersed between different government agencies uh, across the board, its ports, its customs. There's no single body that's responsible for supply chain competitiveness uh, in a country. So I think the first thing that we need is a regulator on a country by country basis that's responsible for the supply chain. We have regulators in banking, we have them in telecom. I think it's about time that we had have them in the supply chain. If 10% of growth is at stake, then I think it makes sense from a policy perspective to, to have such a body. Secondly, that sort of organization needs to be cascaded upwards within ASEAN. So uh, ASEAN also needs to have a, 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 a to mirror that, uh, the, that uh, organization with a, a body of its own that can look at the soft supply chain issues that are really responsible for I think, uh, um, uh, driving growth. Um, thirdly, I think uh, at the end of the day, this cannot be accomplished without really looking at the electronic infrastructure for trade. A lot of investment has been made in ports and airports, and oftentimes those are the easiest to do. But what holds back the, the, the potential of those investments um, is not having an electronic infrastructure that allows all of these stakeholders to communicate with each other and to function as a system. And that's where I think the opportunity lies. Thank you, Tarek. Let's start off with asking Harish about the supply chain I issue as well. I mean, it's the heart of what you do as well. So what needs to be done? Where are we? And what are the next steps? Yeah. No, I think it's, it's, it's a very valid point. And, uh, uh, and like I was saying, uh, when it comes to leveraging efficiencies regionally, it's important. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you don't want to have a situation where there are absolutely no economies of scale, uh, and supply chain plays a really critical role here. I mean, we have, for example, manufacturing plants in almost all the countries. Having said that, the whole logistics behind end-to-end -end, uh, uh, sourcing of raw materials, uh, and, and, and you spoke about specialization, I mean, there is a lot of scope here. Now, I, we haven't quantified it, but all I can say is that more and more companies are moving towards regional supply chains. I think global uh, supply chains, particularly in fast-moving consumer goods, is still a step too far. But regional supply chains, certainly. And I think I fully agree that there is a lot of scope here. Yeah, one of the key projects that we're working on is the National Single uh, 
uh, window. Um, and the goal is to make sure that each of the country has one and will connect to each other because then the imports from one country automatically become the, or the exports rather, from one country become automatically the imports into my uh, country. Not only will make uh, movement uh, of goods uh, much easier, but it will reduce uh, smuggling. Uh, I think a key to this is making sure that we harmonize our standards, our nomenclature, and everything to make sure that our systems uh, work oh. with each uh, other. And we have seen the impact of this in the electronics industry. Uh, it's one of the industries that were integrated ahead of uh, uh, 2015. And in the case of the Philippines, uh, 15, 20 years ago, they were already uh, sounding the net knell for our own electronics industry because the cluster was not complete. But with ad advanced integration, our cluster now is not just the Philippines, but the whole ASEAN cluster. And moving electronic products from the Philippines, say, to Penang or Singapore is just like moving it from Chicago to California. And I think that's what we need to do with the rest of the industries. But this will need a lot of coordination and work. Yeah, okay, so there's the political will to do that. And what benefits do you see from it for your country in particular? Well, of course, uh, <clears throat> to add to uh, extensive prisma is that um, ASEAN member countries has got a commitment to develop ourselves uh, this so-called national single window because we really want to be uh, most efficient when we interconnect it. Among the trouble members. is you have so many different and disparate, as Tarek was saying, government departments who are right. all fighting for their own slice of the cake, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what I'm about to add after that is that once we have uh, international commitment with our uh, uh, dialogue partners, it's also internal commitment because uh, we're talking about uh, several organizations within the country, uh, those government uh, organizations and agencies. We really have to work together in order to develop the so-called national single window. So the strong will uh, on the political side is there because um, we have a, you know, a milestone deadline in order to deliver that. Then I couldn't have agreed more uh, with uh, Sultan Alessa that um, to improve the area of um, government regulatory work can uh, be very effective in terms of uh, economic prosperity. And um, in Thailand, uh, the Minister of Finance, where I'm directly responsible, is assigned with the work from the cabinet to uh, work with all other um, ministries and also government agencies to uh, look into uh, the area that we should improve. Um, ease of doing business is important, and I would like to encourage uh, you all to uh, work hard into that. And if we can achieve that, I'm sure that uh, the uh, economic activities, not only within the country, but you know, from outside, they will trust us more and they will be happy to do business with us with uh, more efficient cost. Uh, what about human capital as well? And I'd like to ask uh, Kojima-san mm -hmm. about that. Human capital, I mean, you've got so many different uh, yeah. factories, plants, et cetera, offices mm -hmm. in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to transfer those staff there. You have a huge amount of uh, mm -hmm. paperwork you have to go through. Okay, I refer a uh, multi-level development framework. And uh, in these connections, and we are developing our business in throughout Asia. Then. Uh, uh, Japanese companies have long uh, recognized and leveraged a multi-level development framework in their own business strategies. And the company has their own business strategies while providing a much needed the transfers of uh, technologies and uh, business practices to other Asian nations. And uh, rather than uh, simply transfer this uh, existing uh, infrastructure and systems when relocating production basis to Asia. Japan companies have worked closely with local employees and uh, utilizing their collective ex expertise to address local issues and challenges while developing the kind of local talent capable of making their own decisions in their future. These processes also facilitated the division of the labor throughout Asia, which helped to make the region's supply chain more efficient. I'm very much confident that this economic diversity, uh, which has served Asia so well in the past, will continue to play a very key role in her future pro prosperity. That's, that's, that's very, very important. I think. Well, I believe human capital is one of the biggest assets of uh, ASEAN. Our average age is 27. 
as opposed to, say, Japan at 43 and uh, Europe at around uh, 43. Uh, but we need to make sure that we will allow mobility. We need to make sure that we invest in them. We need to make sure that we get the right people in the right uh, uh, place. And that's why the Philippines is excited in an integrated ASEAN, because we will be the second largest population in integrated uh, ASEAN, and probably the most uh, uh, mobile. But whether we're mobile or not, it's important we should have the right skills. And that's why since President Aquino took over, he's increased the budget in education by over 50%, and will continue to do so because having our people actively participate in the future ASEAN integrated economy will be crucial to making them believe that it's a win uh, for them. Because if poverty stays, then people will say that they, their life is worse off. So we have to make sure that everybody's a winner. And this is where companies like Unilever, the global companies, will really play a very important role. They cannot put all their eggs in one area. They have to make sure that each country will have a role in this uh, integration so that they will improve their trust and confidence in integration. Can I just, uh, just sure. a quick add to this uh, yeah. thing? Uh, I think there is another dimension that ASEAN countries have to, have to start looking at, which is how do they benchmark globally? And it's not just about regionally. Can I make two points? One on supply chain. We speak about costs. I think the, the, the opportunity for ASEAN is how do you marry the concept of Japanese quality with Asian costs? And how do we really make sure that in terms of benchmarking, you are able to go out there to the rest of the world and be able to show that you can do both. I think there, is, there should be much more emphasis on quality and cost and not just cost. That's one. The second on talent. Again, I would say uh, if a large part of the world's growth is going to come from uh, Asia, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that we are not producing the kind of talent and leadership that, that can be globally benchmarked. And it's a responsibility of countries and companies indeed to build what I call global leaders, not necessarily leaders that are ASEAN leaders or Asian leaders. Tarek, you're, you're, you're going to make this happen to some extent with what you do. So what's your take on it? Well, I think first the issue of, of cost. Uh, it comes back to what I see are the, the supply chain barriers that are actually leading to those costs. I think the way um, you, uh, uh, you address that is by having or thinking about the ability to change. The only constant going forward in the future is that the pace of change is gonna accelerate. And as governments, and specifically around the supply chain, um, it's gonna be very difficult to change with the current approaches. And I think that we need to uh, focus again on this concept of a regulator, focus on electronic infrastructure, because the only way to, to get change to stick is to, to be able to, to manage it in a different way than we have in, in, in the past. And uh, uh, you know, again, with 10% with GDP growth as the, uh, the, the bonus, um, I think it behooves everybody to really focus on this issue. And let's have somebody um, uh, on a country by country basis responsible to actually improve the supply chain on a, on a, on a, on a sort of benchmark by benchmark basis. And uh, only when we, when we get to that stage, I think we'll have the ingredients necessary to actually move very quickly and reap the benefits of, uh, of this change. Kitarang, how far are we away from a genuinely uh, free market, a single market perhaps? When do you envisage it happening? And indeed, human labor, human capital is going to be absolutely at the center of that. Well, um, form-wise, uh, we're not that far away. Substance, perhaps still have to solve a little bit of the problem in the mindset. <clears throat> but I would like to refer that, um, you know, histories uh, repeat themselves. If you talk about, um, you know, the uh, less um, prosperous economic situation, we got to uh, start, uh, suffer or enjoy, depends on how you want to term it, with the unemployment, low uh, wage, uh, cheap labor cost. But then uh, after a while, when uh, the economy can improve uh, itself into a higher prosperity, then the cost of living is higher, wage is higher, then naturally um, the um, more labor-intensive industry, business, and uh, low value added would have to be you know, solely transferred 
to the uh, less prosperous economic uh, activities. That happened in Europe. It happened in East Asia not too long ago, even like three, four decades ago. East Asian countries, uh, the base to produce, to produce um, low-cost garment, then later on it's impossible anymore, and then Thailand absorbed it. Now it's about uh, time for Thailand to uh, work to transfer those uh, labor intensive into the others. Then <clears throat> when, when you talk about um, how, how far away uh, we're from the education, I think, as I said, form-wise, we're not, we're not that far away because you know, ASEAN, for example, we've been working for decades, and as of now, the custom tariff of about 90% of the items is down to zero already. Now, uh, the rest is only uh, very uh, small items. And um, before we approach 2015, I'm sure that all the tariff will be eliminated. But then um, the problem that we have to make sure among ourselves, have confidence among ourselves, would be the NTB, and not to replace the, uh, with the no tariff with the non-tariff barriers. And uh, that has got to be something that we have to hold hands and work together because um, countries will be under some pressure with domestic uh, um, misunderstanding or demand to help solve problems in certain areas. But I, I believe that uh, because of the long period of time that uh, ASEAN countries have been working together, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, we can achieve that pretty easily. As of now, uh, people seem to divide into three steps, like you know, uh, trade in goods, uh, in investment, and then uh, the free flow of human capital. Uh, as of now, I think, instead of doing step by step, the, the three uh, aspects of this of working together in a very good progress. I'm going to bring in Kojima-san before Cesar. Um, Kojima-san, you, of course, uh, have a huge experience with them going up the value chain. You mentioned economic diversity, saying it was one of the great success yeah. stories, why ASEAN was so successful. Uh, could it be a curse as well? Yes. And the presence of many nations being at a different stage of development uh, means that the region is the home to providers of capital and technologies. And the raw materials and the energy and the production bases and the labor are also boosting an impressive consumer market. For businesses, this means there are ample opportunity to build supply chains. Therefore, value chain management and supply chain management are very, very important in Asia. Up to now, say, Japanese companies have invested mainly in Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, and other Asian nations also, and we are now trying to develop more in Asia. We have shared our work, work ethics and the sense of loyalty with the local workforces, introduced Japanese manufacturing techniques, and develop value and supply chains. One example is the Thailand's auto parts industrial cluster, which Japanese companies have promoted. And this kind of business model are now coming out so many. Therefore, uh, we like to develop more business uh, and we like to communicate, collaborate with Asian countries from time to time. Then eventually, the level of the value chain and the supply chain will be now increasing. Cesar, coming back to you. Yeah, to make a point. I'd like to uh, pick up uh, from what uh, Kun Kitarat uh, mentioned earlier that we're getting there. No? Uh, I believe we'll get there if we do not lose sight of ASEAN centrality. And this is where I think uh, TPP, uh, the Trans Pacific Partnership, will pose a key challenge to the ASEAN as a region. Because uh, uh, TPP has four ASEAN members as uh, members. And as you know, the aspiration of TPP is uh, a high standard. Uh, uh, trade uh, agreement. And if that happens, no, uh, the four members no, suddenly become a backdoor entry to the rest of the ten. No? And uh, this can cause problems because the non-TPP member countries of uh, ASEAN who might lose in terms of the U.S. market might start putting up their hands. No? And that's why I think uh, as a block, we should never lose the key premise in integration, which is centrality of ASEAN. And if we lose that, we won't achieve our goal of having a common customs border. We won't achieve our vision of making ASEAN the hub of Asia uh, trade. Because we should not remember, uh, forget the fact that individually, the ASEAN countries are small, unlike the BRIC uh, countries. And we are only strong or stronger if we work together, if we harmonize together and if we look outward uh, together. Because if we start competing 
with each other instead of complementing each other, then we will have challenges, especially from a political standpoint domestically. So I think that's what we should not lose sight of. Yeah, well, um, uh, I can't uh, agree with, uh, with the points that have been made. Firstly, uh, what does a business really want? Business really wants to make sure that there is regional harmonization of regulation. I think that point has been made and it's absolutely critical. The second bit is the eventual removal of not just trade barriers, but non-trade barriers. That's critical. And Such I, as? Sorry? Such as? Such as, for example, uh, you know, uh, 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 pre-inspections that have to be done, quota systems on agriculture products. There are lots of these uh, that, that, that impede movement of goods. And again, I come back to saying uh, ASEAN is bigger than I think ASEAN even imagines. This is 600 million people fast-growing economies surrounded by some really big markets. So my view is that when you, when you talk about intra-ASEAN trade, it's a big opportunity. It's 25% today. If you look at EU, for example, it's two-thirds is intra-EU. Now, you can say they've got bigger countries. But the way I see this, between the, the, the ASEAN and ASEAN plus three, there is a huge intra-trade opportunity that can be unlocked if we can actually create these, these common markets in a true sense. And, and, and the last bit, bilateralism must not trump uh, creating an economic block in ASEAN. And that, I agree with you, is the real danger. Everyone wants to go and do different deals, then the logic of ASEAN goes. Tariq, how do you respond to that? I, I, I totally agree. I think the solution um, um, to the opportunity is within the ASEAN, and I believe that the opportunity needs to be approached from a ground up uh, in ASEAN, and only by doing so will you fully uh, realize the, the poten potential of this uh, uh, tremendous uh, block. Um, Kitarat, okay, this is almost when you t use words like harmonization, it just strikes me, it's, it's almost EU talk here. Now, <laughs> let's move along and talk about <laughs> what else we can talk about the EU and what they've been through. <laughs> Would you see uh, single currencies being ever something which uh, the ASEAN nations would consider or would just shudder at the thought of it? Well, to be as straight and honest, I would say impossible. <laughs> well, the reason is that, um, you know, um, ASEAN countries and to a certain extent, certain the economies in East Asia too, we have uh, together suffered with the Asian economic crisis in 1997. And we have seen uh, the benefit of the um, exchange rate and currencies, um, which uh, I believe that it's the uh, very important substance of uh, this uh, market-based and capitalism system in the country. Um, I think um, if, just imagine, uh, what if um, after 1997, um, Thailand, for example, we somewhat peg our Thai baht currency with the US dollar, 25 baht for so actually, we, by nature, we dollarize ourselves, or we are in the U.S. dollar zone. But what if after that crisis, uh, we have got to still stick to that and then cannot uh, adjust the local currency to the uh, level that would turn the country from a deficit situation to surplus? Um, we perhaps wouldn't have uh, today. Of course, it's so painful in early days that we have got to accept that fact, but it helped uh, solve uh, the economic pro problem of um, these countries in Southeast Asia. So I, I think it's imp impossible for the idea of uh, single currency among the uh, ASEAN members. Uh, I thought you might have a question, Susan. Uh, no, no. Uh, I, I totally agree with uh, Kon Kitarat that uh, single currency is not something we're uh, looking at. But a uh, more integrated financial market is, I think, what is necessary. Individually, our markets are very shallow. What we need to do is create an ASEAN class of financial instruments so that we can attract, continue to attract uh, large capital to the region to help us invest in our infrastructure, invest in our uh, businesses. Uh, we also need to create the market deep enough so that we can recycle our own reserves. What currency would they be denominated in? Though? That's the thing, these financial instruments. It, it, doesn't market, it doesn't matter. So long as the standards are the same, disclosure requirements are the same, the trading platform is the same, they can trade in pesos or Singapore dollars or Thai baht, but the market are uh, connected. That, I think, uh, doesn't need to be one uh, uh, term. By being one doesn't mean you have to lose your individuality. 
I think it's important that you're just working together towards a, a common goal. The reserves of the region is almost a trillion dollars. Imagine we have to send that out to the money centers of the world for uh, foreign fund managers to determine whether they can invest it in ASEAN when it's our own money. And I think it's important that ASEAN people determine where their money goes. And for that to happen, we need to deepen the market. We need to integrate the market. And uh, I think that's a, that's a goal that we should do earlier than the 2020 uh, deadline. Harish, I'm not going to ask you the currency question, but what Thank about <laughs> what about the deepening of uh, these uh, financial markets? And with a company like Unilever, which is so global, does it really matter for you? Well, you know, you know, I, uh, for for a global company, what matters is simplification. And uh, essentially, I think the more important thing is simplification of uh, uh, regulatory processes. That's number one. Uh, simplification of taxes and so on within a country, so you don't create complex myriad uh, this thing. And, of course, financial markets that work. To my mind, I mean, I'm glad you didn't ask me the question on currency. We've got too many experts here. Uh, all I can say is that uh, it's a very theoretical discussion we are having considering what people are seeing in the EU. But having said that, the, 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 the idea is to have a transparent financial market that is as simple as possible. And I think it's, I mean, you know, remember that, that there's not just one currency in the world. There are still many currencies in the world. And the world seems to be moving ahead, and the problems are not caused because, because there is no single currency. So I think it is possible to manage the system even within the current context. Tarek. Uh, I think it's very clear. A single currency would not give us the 10% growth bonus that we're looking for. That's going to come from looking at the supply chain issues that are impeding those opportunities. And that's where we should focus. And the focus first starts at a local basis and, the, and creating the capacity to change and impact the supply chain across uh, each and every country within the ASEAN. And then after that, uh, um, how do you do it for a regional perspective? Tariq, that, I'm interested. This 10% of GDP, uh, is it a one-off or, or is it uh, over a certain length of time? What? You know, the... I think it is a one-off, and I think it's a theoretical number. I personally believe that it's probably a lot, there's a lot more at stake than just 10%. Uh, I, I think it's a compounding sort of repeating uh, benefit because um, when you start um, addressing uh, these, these barriers, all of a sudden all the issues related to labor mobility are being pulled by demand. And, you know, you can, uh, you have a growth that's driving sort of revenue development. You have growth that's driving um, employment opportunities. So it becomes much easier to, to address some of the issues that are facing uh, uh, the ASEAN. So um, that. I'd like uh, the audience to take part now, if they would do. Uh, just uh, raise your hand, say which person you'd like to address, and your name and the organization you're from as well. And I think it's that gentleman with the glasses over there, first of all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Patsuo Master from Japan. I'm teaching in Nagoya. I'm very fascinated with the wonderful talk about towards unification of ASEAN and it's overlapping with what EU has experienced over the last half century. But let me play out a devil's advocate. I'd like to ask one word by each panelist. What would be the largest risks going against the efforts of unification of ASEAN in future? Would that be the impact of climate change? Would that be the joining of PTT or intervention by big powers from outside? Thank you. Get to run and gone first. Well, I think the uh, high risk is um, not uh, those as uh, identified by the, uh, <coughs> um, you, but I believe that it's the um, mindset and understanding of the uh, people. Because by uh, working to get together, um, there are always pro and cons uh, in every move of the um, economic activities and policy. And if, um, of course, um, the uh, administration of the country would try to look at the overall benefit of uh, the integration. But of course, they might have some uh, negative impact, immediate impact on certain groups. And then those certain groups need time to adjust themselves. Um, so I think that the, that's the uh, greater uh, risk. And as a politician, I think uh, it's the political risk 
of the understanding of the waters within the country. I've got to get another politician's view here as well. So <laughs> well, I'm not a politician. <laughs> but uh, I think bilateralism is going to be a, a big uh, issue when countries start, uh, continue to think of themselves vis-a-vis -vis the world rather than ASEAN uh, with the world. Because uh, if that's the case, then uh, it will create all sorts of uh, complications uh, politically uh, for the various leaders of the uh, region. And uh, in any integration process, you need a lot of trust. When people bring their guards down, they want, don't want to make sure that uh, they won't be hit by a punch. You know? So uh, continue to, we need to continue to build the trust. We need to continue to prove to our own people that they will win in a more integrated uh, uh, ASEAN. And all of us, governments, corporations, multilaterals, and the big powers, will have a role if they want to see a stronger integrated ASEAN. Harish, very quick word from you on this. Yeah, I think uh, this is still a socially, economically, and politically a very diverse mm -hmm. region. And uh, staying the course in terms of ensuring that the people on the street uh, s uh, see the benefit of what is good for the country is also good for them. To my mind, that will always be the challenge. And therefore, I mean, to put it simply, inclusive and equitable growth is critical to you know, people looking outside their own boundaries. Lady at the front here, please. Uh, good morning. My name is Barbara Zhao. I am the senior reporter for a publication called Foreign Direct Investment, and I'm representing the Financial Times Group. Uh, my two questions, uh, well, my question is for the two gentlemen who are representing their respective governments, the uh, Honourable Deputy Prime Minister from Thailand and the uh, Secretary of uh, State from uh, Philippines. Uh, my question is with regards to country-specific weaknesses, and there's not much that's been discussed with regards to that. So, for example, Thailand's GDP uh, contracted in the first quarter of this year by about 2%. And so... One of the things that I'd like to know is what measures are you putting in place to offset the possible global headwinds that are happening, for example, the Eurozone slowdown and uh, the consequent effect it's having on your respective economies? And also, uh, one of the things uh, that hasn't been specifically identified is some of the weaknesses in your doing business environment. So could you identify to me uh, what are some of the weaknesses that you have identified and uh, how are you working to counter these? Thank you. Uh, which one of you wants to go first? Well, um, I would say that um, information about the GDP in the first quarter contracted uh, by that percentage as compared to the fourth quarter of last year. But if compared to the first quarter of the year before, it's still 5.3% uh, growth. Of course, uh, we uh, had expected that the year-on-year um, -year growth should be somewhat higher. But of course, um, I think uh, we all understand that uh, the uh, weaker economies that uh, used to be our important buyers, they're not that ready to buy that much from us anymore. So um, that's why uh, when this uh, government of mine stepped into the office a year and a half ago, we uh, made uh, very clear that um, we can't hope that Thailand would be an export-led growth as we have been enjoying in the past a decade and a half and more. And uh, we cannot be too proud of being a cheap labor country. Um, now uh, the country, um, is not suffering with unemployment problem. Actually, unemployment problem in the country, uh, unemployment rate in the country is as low as point, uh, 0.6%. So we have to work to improve the productivity, efficiency, and hope that our people, uh, millions of those uh, people, whether in the urban area or in rural area, would earn more in order that they can uh, improve the quality of life, of course, and also become a better consumer for the products produced in Thailand, also outside Thailand. So I think uh, it's important that uh, we realize that we need to change. And uh, besides, not only the, um, um, improving the purchasing power of the country, but we realized that in the past uh, decade and a half, we haven't invested enough in the uh, necessary infrastructure of the country, especially in transportation system. That's why the government announced a plan to invest uh, as much as 65 billion U.S. dollars in the following seven years to improve all uh, the transportation system of the country. Um, I have all the reasons to believe that uh, after seven years or a decade, 
um, the uh, global economy should uh, be able to solve uh, our weakness problem. But in the meantime, if Thailand work harder in the area of uh, infrastructure investment, it would not only help stabilize our economy in the medium term, but it would prepare ourselves to be most ready when uh, the world is uh, ready to uh, move uh, more aggressive in terms of growth. So after 2020, uh, the planned investment in the transportation system would be completed, and then that's how we look into the immediate term, uh, medium term, and the long term. Cesar, very briefly. Yeah, uh, if you ask the IFC, the Philippines is 138th in the world in terms of uh, ease of doing business. And yet we grew at 7.8% in the first uh, quarter, 6.8% last year. We're one of the few countries that have grown consistently since the Asian crisis. We're among the leaders in BPO. We're number four in shipbuilding, among the leaders in semiconductors. So my question is, if you focus on these weaknesses, then you as a businessman will miss all these opportunities. The important thing is to look at the fundamentals of the country. What are the fundamental assets of the country? Sweet spot in terms of demography for the next 30 to 50 years. Right location, right at the heart of what is the most dynamic economic region for the next 30 to 50 years. Fifth in mineralization, right at the heart of the coral uh, triangle. We're working definitely on this uh, infrastructure challenge, regulatory uh, issues, but definitely I think despite those so-called uh, uh, weaknesses, I think the opportunities are there in the Philippines and the rest of Asia. Could you say very, very briefly, the recent weakness in the yen, does that make Japanese corporates less likely to be expanding abroad and investing abroad and investing domestically instead, very, very quickly? It's a very delicate question. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, therefore, say, I think it may take some more time for us to say, finalize this uh, currency situation in the world, and particularly in Asia. And I have uh, so many offices in the world, therefore I know the Euro problems. And uh, also, the currency itself is very, very, uh, we have to seriously think about that and give us some time. Gentlemen over there in the fourth row, third in. Hi, thank you. Uh, Ken from Parami Energy uh, Local Company. I'd just like to address my, uh, my question to the, uh, Mr. Kajima. And the, uh, you talk about the diversity. I fully agree with you. Diversity makes people excited and motivated. And uh, for example, you, know, you go to Myanmar down south, you have a beautiful beach, and uh, we go up, and then you have a very sunny uh, experience. And then you go to the, uh, the up north, you will have uh, some skiing resource or something like that. So the, I just want to ask you the, uh, the vision of, that you have in terms of this the ASEAN network uh, the, in the future. So how, how, how's, the, how's the Japan and the, uh, the, the, the superpower like Japan see this the East Asia economic network in the future? And the, what are the, uh, the, 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 the major binding factors and what are the challenges uh, to have this the, the network infrastructure to be sustainable. Thank you so much. Very quickly, sir. Yeah. Well, in Japan, say, uh, we have already, uh, since uh, Japanese yen was uh, very high and uh, strong, therefore, say, most of the Japanese, uh, you know, manufacturers have to, you know, say, uh, go out from Japan to manufacture the main products, say, in outside of Japan means Asian countries. And under such circumstances, uh, R&D type of technology should be established in Japan, but uh, uh, actual manufacturing, is, including uh, parts and so forth, are now uh, you know, almost all of them are in, say, Asian countries. Uh, therefore, now under such circumstances, we should collaborate or communicate, or human resources should uh, uh, go on back. And then eventually, uh, we'll go to the, uh, say, right directions. That is the current case. And uh, maybe I do believe, say, some uh, more uh, beautiful situations in Asian countries. That is my idea. Anybody else? Ladies back in uh, the black. Hello, Rowena O'Neill from Sydney, Australia, hub of um, young uh, shapers, young global shapers. My question relates to the comment that was made at the panel about 
the importance of building within ASEAN global leaders. And I'm wondering what can ASEAN government and business do to really enable young people to grow their capacity? Who would like to answer that? I can pick that up since I think I made that point. Uh, um, I think, uh, firstly, let me start with what companies can do. Uh, as your business begins to move more and more east, which is what's happened, you have to have a mindset which says that if you have to, if you have, to have a longer-term perspective on, su on successful, running successful businesses, developing local talent is a necessity, not something that's good to do and so on. Therefore, this over-reliance and dependence on bringing expatriates to run your business. So, for example, in our company, a lot of our local leaders, by the way, are indeed local. Just to give you an example, Myanmar, which is a business we restarted in 2010, is run by a local person. He's a Burmese. Because we do think it's important to have local leadership and develop local talent. So it's a mindset, firstly. And longer term, it serves us well. In Indonesia, we have a local chairman, and so on and so forth. And that's the way we start, a starting position is. Second is, it's not just about leadership. How do you really identify uh, leaders early and build capabilities, organizational capabilities and capacity. Uh, we have a system, for example, where we recruit a thousand interns across the world. By the way, a majority of them are recruited in the developing markets. And the career templates that we create for them are not just uh, building their careers in the local company. People like myself, I'm a product of, uh, of exactly that process that I'm describing to you. Uh, and, and I think, therefore, uh, companies have to do their bit. As far as countries are concerned, uh, it starts really with providing, you know, it, it, it's the educational facilities that you provide, and how do you really create the, the, the infrastructure for, I would say, um, uh, high quality education, at least, uh, you know, at, at the primary level, because that's where it all kind of starts. So it's a combination of both, and I find that there are lots of countries now engaging with the private sector in terms of generally lifting the skills and capabilities of their people. I really do believe the big issue in Asia, not just ASEAN, but larger Asia, is employability. We have a large number of graduates coming out, but there's no employability to that extent. So we have to work together on that agenda. Very, very, very quickly, Tarek. Well, the, the sectors that are most impacted by, uh, by supply chain barriers are the SMEs. And I think if you're thinking about how do you develop young leaders and create opportunities going forward, I think you have to look at the segments of the economy that are most heavily impacted by these non-trade uh, barriers. So I think that's one part of the solution. The second, obviously, is focusing on unlocking the growth potential. Growth means there's more opportunity for everybody, including young leaders, to, to, to develop. Well, that uh, concludes that, the audience bit. I want to just ask one final question of each of you. Don't spend too long on it, please, which is, uh, what will ASEAN look like in a decade? What will it look like, and what would you like it to look like in a decade? And I think we'll start with Harish. ASEAN will continue to be, to my mind, uh, the biggest economic uh, growth areas uh, in the world. Uh, and if you're talking about a decade, it's not a very long time. So I, I, I think I'll put my money on ASEAN. kojima san Yes, I think so. I have the same ideas. And decade time, Asian is, uh, is uh, say, in economically the uh, biggest in the world. And uh, uh, I'm watching the, uh, say, ASEAN's economy and Latin American economy is now going up. And also China economy is uh, now, but uh, still very big. And therefore, in total, uh, ASEAN economy is uh, the biggest in the world. That is my idea. Well, I think um, the um, effort of uh, ASEAN 10 working together, um, I don't think we try to group ourselves, integrate ourselves, and then exclude ourselves from the rest of the world. We only believe that once we are working together, we can improve the standard of practice and governance and rules and regulations, and also mindset to make it most harmonized among ourselves. So I do believe that um, after a decade, uh, all the members will be uh, at the higher standard. 
<coughs> and once it's higher, the standard is, would be, it would be good for all of us, uh, for ourselves, for the other uh, mem members in ASEAN, also for the world. And I uh, believe that uh, we still want to work for the rest of the world to really understand whatever practice we should improve. Before my departure, I have the chance to attend a, a company, a Korean company, opening the new hybrid headquarters in Thailand. And um, the majority of the uh, subsidy uh, of that uh, <coughs> company is actually a Japanese company sending the help executive to Japan. Also, the other shareholders uh, happen to be Malaysian. So I think um, some uh, reporters do ask me that, uh, why is this happening? And uh, they're not opening up the factory in Thailand. They're sending products produced from Korea to, into Thailand. How I would uh, respond to that? I said, I'm very happy. If uh, it's right for them to open factory here because we are good enough, so be it. If it's not, let's work with all of them together in the most uh, constructive way. Derek. I, I think 10 years from now, we'll probably be saying the same thing. There's probably the most exciting uh, investment uh, region opportunity there is. All you have to do is look at the age structure of the population, countries like Indonesia, and realize that you know, in, in 10 years, you still won't be able to address the opportunity that that market is going to create intrinsically from its own growth. So you're saying ASEAN uh, has a great future, and in 10 years, it'll have a great future. That's right. right. Cesar, final word. Well, if we don't lose sight of uh, ASEAN centrality, I think you'll see an ASEAN with uh, more than double the GDP, more than double the per capita, with more than double the intra-ASEAN uh, trade, and uh, with ASEAN uh, achieving its vision of uh, becoming the hub of uh, Asia trade, intra-Asia trade. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Please uh, put your hands up for Kajima San, Cesar Purisima, Harish Manwani, Kitrat Narong and uh, Tarek Sultan Al-Isa. Thank you. Thank you.